Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to my talk. It's about uh, build a near real-time ETL platform using Spark and Alexio. Um, my name is Wan Chun Wang. I work for a company called VIP Shop. A quick introduction of my company. VIP Shop is a leading online discount retailer for brands in China. Last year, we sold over 12 billion US dollar goods <coughs> over the internet. Um, on the average day, there are more than 20 million users using our mobile app or come to our website. Um, in the next 20 minutes, around, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a, a brief introduction about our big data system. And uh, I'm going to use uh, a use case to uh, describe how we achieve uh, uh, building a near real time solution. We talk about the challenge in using our current batch platform and also the, the step we take to speed up the application. Mm, finally, I have some number to compare, um, different approach. Um, OK, uh, overview of our big data system. A mailing contains two parts, the streaming component and the, the batch ETL. Uh, as you can see here, we no longer follow the pure Lambda architecture, which is basically have a complete separate path to process the data in real time and batch. Um, in the last couple of years, we adopt this a single pipeline to pre-process the data in real time. Meanwhile, the data get periodically synced to the data lake, which is our uh, the ETL, drive, ETL job primarily running. And this is all our focus today. Um, the, we see the interesting trend is in our company uh, is getting more and more uh, uh, the automatic data-driven decision approach. So the business people just come ask us, uh, instead of waiting for a day or every hour for the result, they want to see the result updated every few minutes. One of the core ap applications is called sales attribution. Basically, it's a process to identify a set of user action or events. Um, and uh, basically, we, we need to think the importance is the sequence of event and associated with an action for, for, for e-commerce vendor like us, it basically is a purchase. And we assign the value to those events. Uh, if the example here is you open the app, you go to the main page, you go to the list, uh, product list, then you go to detail, you may eventually add it to your shopping cart and make the purchase. Of course, uh, a real user experience is much more complicated. The user might go back and forth multiple times. So it's, uh, this is the sales attribution is a process uh, to identify the most relevant path to, uh, to trigger the transaction. Uh, OK. The sales attribution, is the logic itself, is a pretty complex process. Um, we used to run as a batch job. We run, I think it's every hour. Um, it, every time it's, it takes all the data for that day and then process it. And uh, normally it takes like 30 minutes to finish, but when it's a busy day, there's a lot of activity. That the amount of data need to be processed, uh, you know, multiply. So we can easily see like two, three hours delay. Uh, the business people definitely don't like that. And the process itself was involved multiple input data source like order, users activity. There's order may have sub orders. And there's uh, other the pre sale everything. Um, some the we, you can think about each data source like table. So some table are pretty large. They are contain billions of record. And uh, if you put on the disk, even it's in, um, compressed, it's take a few hundred gigabyte space. <coughs> the the, the logic to compute the sales path is written by those business people. Uh, they write like page, page, SQL scripts. It's, and uh, also they use a lot of uh, user-defined function. It's very hard for, like say, data engineer to come in to try to uh, modify the algorithm and the improve performance. Um, but still, the business people have a very strict demand. They want to see the result every five minutes. Even you know, you know, in the very busy time, they say no less than no more than 15 minutes. <coughs> to run the uh, ET job, ETL job in our current Hadoop platform, 
in such a high frequency, there's a lot of challenge. Um, we have about over 200,000 jobs running every day, and uh, the data was primarily stored on HDFS. Uh, now we have about 1,400 data nodes, and we have um, another smaller, much smaller SSD cluster. And uh, there's also a few hundred Spark nodes running. Just they don't st they don't store data, but it's just like using it for pure computing power. Even in normal days, the usage are about 80 percent. Um, so we, every month we have promotion for a few days, and th during those times the resource gets even more saturated. So under such a high volume, there's a many issue you can imagine uh, will contribute the inconsistency of data access time such as like, name node RPC is too high, or some data node has sw slow response. Plus, if you run the app, it's just like no more MapReduce job, uh, even a simple, maybe simple SQL, you have to wait in the queue for a few minutes before it get launched. Definitely, so we need to make it faster. In old days, our approach was very simple, just adding more hardware. You need more, you have faster, or you want to, you already process more data, just adding machines. But that's become too expensive. It's not an option. We have to optimize it. So the first thing uh, we think about is, right now, this sales attribution apps, every iteration is repro reprocess the, the whole data. It's a, it's a big waste. So we, we're thinking about using the incremental update. Uh, another thing is, because the volatility of the the large cluster, we want to create a uh, relative isolated environment. And there, we, we, we set up a Spark cluster. Then uh, we gave us more consistent uh, resource allocation. And because the, the computation itself will reuse the same set of data multiple times, and so we want to cache it locally. And also, we want to have a faster read or write. Uh, this diagram is a simplified version to show you how we achieve uh, incremental update. Um, sorry, maybe you cannot read that uh, clearly, but just imagine that we run at uh, every, win every interval, uh, we receive the user behavior data. Um, we, we use that, use, we figure out all the active user, then we join with the history table. So we put up all the all the activity for those active users. And we feed it to the sales attribution computation framework, and it will calculate the right pass result. Then it will merge with the, pre the result from the previous iteration. And then they gener eventually generate a snapshot for the, uh, f which is the, the current for all the users. So as, as you can see here, the number of records need to be involved in the computation is much less. So we, we save a lot of CPU time, but uh, because our data was stored not in any KB store, it's still in a sequential file like a, a Parquet or ORC. So we still need to load, when we load the history data, everything in. So we actually has to merge uh, the inputs on the input side, also on the output side. So there's actually put more burden on the read and write. So this is the uh, satellite cluster we have to process this sales attribution. Uh, we have Sparks uh, as running uh, as an engine, and uh, Alexio was set up local uh, co-located. On the left side, you see that's the, the delta data. The every time every interval, there's incoming user data was coming in. They first stored in Alexio, then the the main attribution job will kick out and then rewrite the data multiple times. Um, the, there's also actually a couple of downstream Spark applications was running. They also uh, can access the data with stored in Alexio. Eventually, most of the time they do this, is they process the detailed data, they do the aggregation, then they, they eventually they save the data, that which normally is a much smaller table, uh, to the data lake. Uh, in sales attribution, we actually have some uh, jobs running outside. Uh, they also need to access the data uh, within in Alexio. And um, in that case, to, the, to those applications, they just treat this as a normal hype table. Uh, 
uh, the, the here is a little bit spec of the cluster we're using. It is running Spark and Alexio 1.8, the current this is our, the current production, uh, with 27 nodes. Uh, we, the, we give the, the memory is 256, relatively high compared to the machines uh, using for other purpose. And uh, Alexio co-located with Spark to give us very consistent I/O read read time. Um, to ensure we have enough space to cache data, especially during those promotion time, we use memory plus the hard drive. Um, and uh, because all the data, for in our case, are you can think of their transient data. If we, even the Alexa crash, we can re restart it and we can reload the data from remote HDFS cluster. So in this case, we're a little bit greedy. We just disable the multi-copy feature. So this gives more room to s store data. Uh, we do find is uh, when we configure the whole memory thing, we need to leave some memory for the OS. Otherwise, uh, is we sometimes the crash and we, we keep have to restart the system. Um, some number comparison. Um, first thing, we compare using the Spark X directly access the remote HDFS cluster. Uh, we saw on average it's about uh, one to two times slower compared to the Alexio benchmark. But actually the biggest problem is uh, because the inconsistency of the from read write from the large cluster, uh, there's a lot of spikes. And imagine like if we run the job every five minutes, you have a spike itself, it may take like 10 minutes. Uh, it's causing a lot of delay, and this is a very bad cascade effect. We also try to uh, set up a local HDFS. So we try to compete with just hard drive with memory. In this case, it depends on the, the, the type of file or the size of the file. We generally see like 30% to 100% slow compare, uh, you know, using disk versus Alexa, which is primarily hitting the memory. As I said earlier, we have a, we have a dedicated SSD cluster. Uh, we try that also. Uh, actually, we put that in production for a few months uh, because, you know, the people in operation, they like have a single stack. Uh, even Alexa is nice, but they still think, let's try that with uh, just the faster disk. Uh, actually, on the normal days, is is very good. It's pretty. Uh, it's on par with the result of response time with Alexio. But um, during those, uh, I think it's November 11, we have a promo big promotion period. Uh, the res the latency was much worse than we anticipated. Compared to we, the same amount of load, we already did the benchmark test, but. It, uh, the result there is, uh, you know, double the latency. So we have to switch back to Alexa and, uh, you know, we are happy. Uh, similarly, we ha also have a set up a dedicated Alexa cluster. Um, it's a similar issue, I guess, because network, uh, um, we, the, the performance still not as good as when we co-located Alexa with the computation. Last, using the Spark cache, um, we're using Spark Cache occasionally for uh, small uh, files, but unfortunately, in the source attribution, both the like the user view, uh, their activity, and or the pass, uh, those files are uh, too big. They are like a few hundred gigabytes. Once they into JVM, they get exploded. So we can now using uh, the the Spark Cache cache those objects. Plus. In our computation, most of the time, we only use the data twice. So, but the first time they initialize the cache is very slow. I think people using Spark, you probably realize that. So it doesn't uh, worst the effort. And we do also, we split the logic into multiple Spark application. Uh, if you just cache it in a single Spark contact, uh, other apps still cannot take advantage of the cache. Lesson learned. Um, so when we started moving, converting those uh, slow, uh, low frequency ETL jobs to uh, this much high frequency um, near real time job, uh, we are actually facing uh, quite a few challenge. Uh, one thing is uh, we even we have a fast uh, scheduling, fast execution, but if we need to copy uh, the large amount of data from one place to another. I still take a lot of time. For example, the if we have 
the detail we have a few hundred gigabytes. Uh, need to copy from Alexio to HDFS. That's take like one or two minutes at least. So that's defeat the whole purpose. In that case, we try to uh, move those downstream application uh, to the place where we run everything. Um, another thing is how to manage those uh, near real time jobs. Now, we, we first we consider we using the existing framework out of say Spark. The Spark has the stream, uh, Spark streaming. They also later they have the structure streaming, but uh, for some of our ETL application, they have the set operation is this multiple steps. They have uh, multiple input and output at different stage. It just seems too hard to write a, a single gigantic uh, streaming job to handle this. And we also try to uh, split it into multiple jobs. But then the, there's still question is how to coordinate it because there's a dependency. Our our batch system has, we, we have an in-house solution for do the manage the batch jobs. Um, uh, but the, it's more, the, this, the scheduling there is more geared up towards those low frequent executed uh, jobs, for example, daily or hourly. And uh, it's, it basically build the process dependency deck um, and uh, it executed at every fixed interval. Um, for example, let's say you have five minutes, uh, five minutes interval uh, ETL. If the if the job started at ten o'clock, but for some reason it cannot finish, has not finished at the ten o five, then the ten o five instance will be uh, launched at the same time. So you're going to see multiple instances running uh, at the same time. If the delay was causing by this the resource problem then having this so many instances piling up make the things even worse. So we need some uh, improvement. Um, what we did is uh, instead of just purely depends on the processes, uh, we build, a, we call it watermark services, is whenever the data is ready, it report it to the data mark service. So this way give us a, uh, to coordinate between multiple process, uh, they, even they are, was not under the same scheduler, they can still try to figure out what's the right time to, to execute. Um, and the other thing is we realize, um, unlike the traditional batch job, uh, the near real time is, we, the, the user, the, the ultimate goal for the user is to see the result fast. They don't not necessarily say, oh, I have to, see the report for every five minutes. That's not their really the, the interest. So what we do is, let's say if there's a, it's a batch or was delayed for a few cycles, instead of just processing the data which has already been there for a long time, for only for that cycle, he will, uh, it will take all the unprocessed data and uh, compute them in one shot. So the good thing is uh, it, you, you catch up quick to the, the current result. That, but you know, we don't guarantee that you always see the report for every interval. Um, when dealing with the use case like in the sales attribution, there are certain data input data source is not uh, critical. So they will mark as optional. In th this case, we, even those optional data source not uh, been updated, uh, we still kick off the, that iteration and uh, so the, the, the result will get out quicker. But later on, they will adjust itself in the next cycle, then we'll see the, when the optional data has become uh, refreshed. Okay, talking about the benefit of using Alexio, well, we think the first is the easy of use, um, whether it's in production or in a staging or test, we just flip the URL from H DFS to Alexio, uh, so people are really happy with that. Um, and with work with Spark, um, it's easy for us to, we, if we need some uh, temporary storage for caching, uh, we can just either have a build a, quickly build a satellite uh, cluster, or in our large clusters, we can have some, uh, label the machine, and uh, we, we set up Alexio there. Uh, uh, in our data center, we have multiple data centers. Is 
it's relatively easy. If we need some machine, we can get a machine or add some memory, but uh, uh, we still have, uh, it's much difficult to get the machine with SSD, SSD drives. So um, for, for caching, uh, Alexa give, seems much easier for us to deploy something. Uh, one thing I want to mention here is Spark and Alexio are running on Kubernetes. Starting this year, we, we are, we're targeting to have about uh, 1,000 machines running on Kubernetes. And, but those machines are, will be sh rearranged for different purpose. Uh, so on a different day or a different time of day, we may run uh, streaming jobs, or we run the Spark ETL jobs, or we do uh, uh, ad hoc query uh, using uh, Presto, or we even have a machine learning jobs running on this. So they need to be redeployed back and forth. Uh, we think using Alexio seems give that's feed the purpose, have a quick deployment. Um, for sales attribution, we have been running using Alexio over the past two and a half years without any major issue. Uh, so that really gave us a peace of mind. And uh, I say, I want to say thank you to Alexa Engineer here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I have one more slice. Um, yeah, when we try to uh, roll out Alexa to other, uh, other use cases, we do realize one challenge is sometimes we, the data need to be, yes, it will be consumed for the next iteration, but also need to be persisted for some other thing. Um, Right now is the business people have to, whether they're using you know, Java code or writing SQL, they still have to have a actual work to copy the data from one place to another. And we've been trying uh, like using uh, synchronous position, we find that's slow, uh, but uh, right now I'm glad to learn that uh, Alexa 2.0 provide this async persistent capability. We're really looking forward to have that which should provide the transparency to our business users. Um, another thing we, we, we think we can do is, right now because of our large cluster, the load is very high, one of the reasons that the, the HT, uh, Hadoop temp directory uh, was, has a lot of noise, a lot of traffic, uh, we're thinking try to using the SSD drive to host those directory and uh, we think we can use in Alexio to manage those uh, uh, place. And this will be a, uh, the whole cluster wise. Earlier I mentioned we have a 1400 data nodes. Uh, we are thinking, we, we're currently in the testing stage, but hopefully it can give us a ben lot of benefit. Um, the other thing is uh, do the caching for Presto. Uh, we have a fairly large Presto cluster right now about 600 machines and those presto primarily for ad hoc query by internal user as well as uh, the external partners we have a lot of business partners they, they do work. so the, the the query response time is very sensitive you know to the set to to the satisfaction of the user and um, but on the other side uh, if there's any delay in the hdfs uh, they were causing a lot of unhappy customer so we're hoping with the cache layer in place can smooth out the, those spikes. Um, yeah, so that's the end of my talk. Um, thank you very much. Are you, are you not running any machine learning modeling on this platform? Machine learning. You mean on Alexio? On this cluster, no. This is. Um, this cluster, as I said, is a satellite cluster. Uh, was dedicated to run few uh, critical ETL jobs. Right. Uh, we have actually one of my team was building a, a called, uh, we called MLP, a machine learning platform. Um, that's just right now is on the Kubernetes I mentioned. So I think you mentioned at one point that your HDFS cluster runs at eighty percent <coughs> utilization. Um, I'm curious if that has dropped down since you started running these satellite clusters, and if so, do you get better consistency uh, in that environment with a low utilization? Oh, uh, that's a good question, but uh, 
you see we, this cluster only have 27 nodes, and that, the, the cluster we're running the, the yarn on the, the HDFS is uh, over 1,000. Uh, so, but we, we constantly do optimization. We try to offload things. We are, we are actually, in the, in the past one year, we're offloading a lot of work from um, the main cluster uh, to some, say, Spark cluster. We run some Presto cluster. But on the other side, the business people, they keep dumping new requirement. They keep, uh, they, oh, yeah, they keep running those things. Yeah. And the, the, the other thing is they never take off the, the thing they never used. So we have to keep running some uh, sanity checks. Oh, those are output, but there's no downstream app consume it. Can we close, shut it down? But, yeah. So we save, we save like say 50 machines there. They need uh, another 100 machines there. <laughs> <laughs> It's a constant that we had to fight for that. <laughs> so uh, last September, uh, we rolled out a program called Zero Growth on Hardware. Uh, it's not Zero Growth on Business, but uh, we just say every team, whether you're a logistic team, you're an accounting team, you come here, you say, I need more machine. Uh, number one, we say, uh, no more. No, but <laughs> if, all right. Or you, or we can say, hey, we find out you have a lot of things can optimize. We give them a hint. We give them some guidance. You do this, as a we can trade. <laughs> Any other questions for Vanshan or for Calvin? No, we're good. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, well, you, the, okay, sorry. The, the question is, do I have any comparison using, uh, compare between using Spark Cache versus uh, Alexa? Yeah. Right. Um, I, th I think if the, if you, the, I think we find that generally the Spark Cache it's not as fancy as we anticipated. Uh, uh, if you reuse the cache for multiple times, probably it's worth it. But uh, in our case, our data size uh, is, you say, over uh, 100 gig. Um, the initialization of that Spark cache uh, is quite slow. Um, and if we only use it for like two, three times, uh, still not worth it. So we spend a lot of time doing this. First, cache it, or then not using it, but just directly read it from the file. Because like reading from parquet file is pretty fast, especially when the file is large. And uh, there's a lot of other technique I think is really help instead of just decide where to cache it. For example, we have, uh, we, when we do this drawing, we're based on the user, right? And if we do bucketing, we can bucket by the user ID uh, then uh, we avoid a lot of network shuffle. So reading from disk is, is very, uh, actually, it's not the bottleneck. One question. What is the Spark version you're running? I believe there, oh, the Spark version we're running for this app is, I think it's 2.1. Um, but right now, the, we are rolling out 2.3.2, I believe. Thanks. Even that right now it's 2.4 is out, but normally we say don't try the, the first release of the ma any major thing. I don't know. I don't know. So there is a Kafka cluster running. Kafka. Kafka cluster running. Oh, the, where is the Kafka cluster running? Uh, yeah, it's separate. We, we, have, we, we heavily use in Kafka, all, all the pipeline. Uh, I think I remember my first one of the early slides has everything, the raw data was in Kafka, then we do some cleansing, they still write to get back to Kafka, then further augmentations maybe still go to another Kafka. Uh, but uh, for this app, it doesn't consume uh, directly from Kafka. It's all, there's, there's a sync job, which is read from Kafka, do something, then every five minutes write to uh, as a high file. Great. Well, thank you, Wanshan and Calvin, for tonight's great presentation. Thank you.